Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Blocker Intelligence YouTube channel. As always, we're going to be coming at you with some market trends from this week in terms of stuff that you should be looking for moving forward and also explaining some of the actions that happened in the market from this week. Um, keep in mind, before we get into this, uh, pretty soon we're going to be launching the Blocker Intelligence Indicator Dashboard, um, which that's that's something I'm, I'm really excited about. I've been allocating a lot of kind of my mental energy to that. Um, a lot of the stuff that we look at in the newsletter as well as I post on Twitter will be on there. So uh, really stoked for that to launch. It's, it's really sick. Like, you know, it, it looks so really, it, it looks so nice uh, as well as it's, you know, the functionality is, is, is great as well. So I think it's a, it'll, it'll be a product that uh, you guys will all really enjoy. So let's go ahead and get into this week. Uh, first of all, Last week, we talked about how I didn't really have a strong um, view on the market in terms of short-term short -term price action, long-term thesis in terms of uh, bullish continuation over the coming months hasn't changed since the summer. Um, but what, what we talked about in the short term was that we were expecting volatility. Um, and so another thing we noted was when we were looking at these volatility squeezes, um, the last three times we had broken out in one direction to grab liquidity from breakout traders before reversing and going the opposite direction. So here we broke down before reversing, here we broke up before reversing. Um, and so we actually did get this again. Um, when I posted the newsletter, we were right in the middle of the bands, but I said, you know, whichever way this starts to trend, keep that in mind because we'll probably see a reversal. Uh, and we did in fact get that reversal. We broke above, grabbed that liquidity and reversed um, with that in mind, just some price levels, you know, I kind of remain bullish above this green zone, which is the point of breakdown from earlier this year, which is actually right around 50K. Um, you know, I think theoretically, I'm not saying this will happen, but the market could pull back down to those levels, 51 to 53K and still be, um, you know, macro bullish. Uh, this week, we had another leverage fr uh, flush on Wednesday. Uh, this is kind of evident through a couple things. So we had uh, you know, open interest increasing, especially from Binance. Um, once we broke all-time highs, we saw this really come in, um, as well as we had uh, you know, some, some, uh, an, an increase in funding as price started to, to grind down with, with uh, you know, this open interest. And in specific, uh, we saw a lot of coin margined open interest contracts. Um, we, what we talked about is like, the, the, the crypto margin versus the stable coin margin contract thing where, um, you know, the, the, when, you, when you're using crypto as collateral, um, there's more convexity, which is just a fancy term for saying as the trade goes against you, if you're long, not only is your P&L decreasing, but also the, uh, your margin is decreasing in value. So you're less collateralized for that contract. And so you're more easily, uh, you're more easily flushed or, or liquidated or, or, you know, your stop loss is to be, to be triggered. Uh, and so that's kind of what we saw here uh, in combination with we had like the Evergrande news as well as the CPI data and also a couple major exchanges going down, including FTX, which rarely goes down in, in any kind of big move. So, um, you know, all these kinds of things kind of you know made the perfect storm for kind of a leverage flush out. Um, I don't think you can ever really contribute uh, price action to one specific thing, but I think this kind of recipe was, you know, set us up for a nice little leverage flush in total $536 million of longs got liquidated on Wednesday. Here we take a look at the seven day uh, or weekly version of SOPR. This is our spent output profit ratio, which compares the profit that market participants are realizing and the, the losses that market participants are realizing. Uh, and so as long as we're above this one threshold, which if you just think, you know, when you divide one by one, right, it, it's one or, or you divide 10 by 10, it's, it's one because the, you know, the, the profit is neutralizing the loss. So it's, it's, it's neutral, right? There's no, uh, you're not in a state of profit or loss, you're, you're flat. Um, and so that's kind of the bull bear threshold. When we're above, we're in a state of profit below, we're in a state of loss. Um, earlier this year, we got this, well, back it up to 2020. Uh, after the 20, 25% correction at the end of September, we bounced right off of one. So I continued uptrend, a bearish divergence, which I should have labeled in here, but I didn't, uh, which just means the oscillator is making lower highs as price is making higher highs. So that was kind of a, a precautionary, you know, telltale sign that we're probably going to get a reversal. Uh, came back down, broke below one, which is a, you know, bearish break. But then we were, you know, we still don't have the confirmation uh, but then we did get that when we had this failed break above the range over summer. Uh, so got that failed underside retest of one, which was confirmation. And once again, uh, you know, a couple of weeks later, 
Very shortly after that, we had the bullish break above one, uh, but that wasn't confirmed until the end of uh, September when we retested 40K, got that bullish confirmation since then, kind of been trending upwards. Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we just continued trending up as we did at the end of last year. But on any kind of major price correction, what you do want to see is for us to come back down and retest this one threshold as support. Um, if we came back down and, and you know, retest it again as you got bullish confirmation, you know, I think that would be real, real heavy, you know, uh, be undeniable at, the, at that point that, you know, we're in a bullish trend if we get another bounce off one. Uh, but, you know, this, this, is, this was confirmation of that, you know, broader bullish market structure. Um, yeah. And of course, what you don't want to see is us, you know, break below and then uh, also, you know, have a failed underside retest. But, you know, break below would, would be bearish and then bearish confirmation would be that failed underside retest, as we mentioned. Um, so now we're looking at URPD, uh, which is the uh, UTXO realized price distribution. So you're looking at where, you know, where, where certain portion of supply is last moved at different price levels. So. Uh, for example, you know, let's say a coin is last moved at, you know, 2K, so $2,000 at, at this bar, and then it's now moved at 60K. Well, then that value of coins is going to be moved from this bar over to, you know, the, the bar at 60K here. Uh, and so what you see is that above uh, the $1 trillion market cap threshold, which is right about here, uh, you see there's kind of this line in the sand with investor behavior. Uh, about 18.36% of Bitcoin's money supply has moved above the $1 trillion market cap threshold which is uh, essentially, in my mind, confirmation for market participants that this growing asset class, which is Bitcoin, um, is here to stay. So next, we take a look at uh, a new variant of liquid supply that I created yesterday. So usually we look at the liquid supply shock ratio, which compares uh, illiquid to the highly liquid and liquid guys, essentially weak to strong hands. Uh, we've talked about the definition of this before. Uh, liquid supply is defined as supply that's held by entities. Uh, well, they hold at least 75% of the supply that they take in. Uh, high, uh, highly liquid is uh, they, they sell over 75% of the coins they take in. So for every four coins they take in, they sell at least three of them. Um, and then the liquid guys are just 50-50. Uh, and so what we're looking at here is the liquid supply shock ratio with the 60-day RSI on it. Um, RSI is essentially a momentum oscillator, relative strength index. Uh, and what we what we see here is that we you know in in the in the uh, towards the end of the bull market we get these bearish divergences that print so at the end of 2017 as well as earlier this year uh, and once we once we break uh, you know above that that trend line that's showing a, a reversal in the market structure so uh, you know we had this bearish divergence in 2017 came back up and and reversed off of the the 2018 floor and and in early 2019 we broke back above that trend line and that was kind of confirmation. Um, had this uptrend in the, in the ratio and then had another bearish divergence at the beginning of this year. Um, and so we've broken above the trend line, which is, uh, you know, a bullish reversal or whatever you want to call it, bullish confirmation uh, last month, since we're kind of hovering up here, um, you know, just looking forward. And I'm not saying that I am bearish, but I'm just saying what you would be looking forward over the coming months is to start to see a couple touches of, some, you know, uh, some kind of bearish divergence trend line. Um, and, you know, once that, as you can see, once that upper trend line broke, uh, that, you know, that was signal that we were going to drop off and you saw liquid, you know, a bunch of coins becoming liquid. Um, you know, so keeping it, keep an eye on this over the coming months in terms of the signature that we saw earlier this year. Next up, we have checkmates metric. This is uh, the market realized gradient or, or the delta gradient. You know? So what you're looking at is the comparison of the rate of change of realized cap versus price. So realized cap we've talked about before is looking at the last time it's the capitalization of Bitcoin based on the last time coins were moved. Um, another way to think about it is just it's the cost basis or volume weighted average price of Bitcoin. Uh, and so we're looking at here is um, the, the divergence between the gradient and price. Um, so you had less capital inflows as the speculative bid was, was pushing Bitcoin's price up higher earlier this year. Um, wasn't looking at this at the time, uh, but, you know, because I was kind of a noob at the beginning of the year. Uh, I'm not saying I know everything now, but you know, definitely was it looking at uh, you know data in this in this level of granularity. Uh, but would you know, looking forward, we're we're looking to spot another bearish divergence in the oscillator. But for now, we've just been trending upwards. And then next, we have on-chain cost basis. This is created by my good buddy uh, Dylan Leclaire. What we're looking at here is the short-term holder and long-term holder realized price, which we just uh, talked about. But that was we've talked about it many times before. Um, and, and so in specific, what we're looking at here is when, when short-term holder cost basis or, or realized price goes below long-term holder, 
because uh, that's essentially showing that all the, the short-term guides have left the market at the very bottom, right? Uh, and then as well, and, and so those are good, uh, you know, accumulation opportunities. And then as well, when, when short-term holder uh, realized price way overshoots long-term holder realized price, uh, we can kind of identify these like overheated zones. Um, so where we're kind of sitting here is not anywhere near overheated, although it looks like we're starting to reverse here. Uh, keep in mind, this full reversal in 2013 took about two or three months. Uh, so getting back up to this upper threshold can, can you know, happen pretty quickly and, and we'll definitely, you know, keeping an eye on that. Next, we're looking at long-term holder net position change. This is looking at the 30-day change of long-term holder supply. So what was long-term holder supply 30 days ago and what is it now? And looking at the net change between that. Uh, and so the reason I look at this is just because it's, uh, you know, if, if you start to see a, a trend in this, you know, you know, it's a, it's a broader structural trend because, you know, you're, you're seeing this in like a 30-day kind of, uh, you know, broader shift versus just like some kind of day-to-day -day movement per se. Uh, and as we talked about many times before, natural bull market behavior, as you can see in this chart here, uh, is that long-term guys accumulate into weakness. So for example, between the 2013 double pumps uh, into the bear market before 2017, uh, leading into you know, the, the rally of, of last year, um, they, they accumulate heavily there and then they sell into strength. So as you can see, they sold the two 2013 tops, sold 2017, sold at the end of last year, especially in the beginning of this year. Um, and then the short-term guys buy their bags the whole way up. And so this is just looking once again at that 30-day change of the long-term holder supply. What we see is that we got our first red prints, which mean that uh, long-term holders are now starting to distribute. This is also evident in things like average spent output lifespan, spent volume age bands, spent output, uh, I'm sorry, spent output age bands, uh, as well as coin days destroyed, uh, dormancy, dormancy flow. Uh, and I'm throwing a bunch of jargon out, but what I'm just saying is uh, all these different metrics are showing in confluence that long-term holders are starting to distribute their coins, which is once again, natural bull market behavior. I posted this this morning and you know maybe it's just miscommunication on my end, but there are a lot of people misinterpreting this as a bear thing. Um, you know, This is once again, natural bull market behavior. Uh, as you can see, they started to distribute um, you know, last year at kind of the, the end of October, uh, which is coincidentally right around where we are now. Uh, not, you know, just, I think that's a coincidence in terms of the timing, but, you know, it's just showing that the, you know, the broader bullish trend is, is beginning and the long-term guys are starting to scale out because they don't perfectly time the top and they don't perfectly time the bottom, right? They, you know, long-term guys didn't sell 60K. They really heavily sold um, actually in January on this first up thrust. That's kind of where they peaked out their selling. Uh, so, yeah, I'm in, I mean, watching for something like this where, you know, you really see a large uh, long-term holder, you know, uh, distribution. And then that doesn't necessarily say we're at the Pico top, but it's like, okay, you know, now we're, we're getting into the territory where it's coming. Right. And then, you know, once again, this is just showing that dynamic in a broader sense. Next, we look at mean transaction fees. So average transaction fees. Um, I think fees are kind of a good proxy for demand for block space. Um, and so we're looking at here is kind of this uptrend that we've started in that, um, you know, kind of natural bull market behavior when, you know, new market participants come in, uh, you know, you get speculators coming in, exuberance coming into the market. Uh, you get a real increase in, in uh, transaction fees, which we saw in 2017 as well as last year. So watching to see if we get a continued uptrend in that, as well as, you know, you can see these very distinct peaks at the, the like kind of pico top of, of a bull market. And that's showing you have this real speculative mania blow off top. Um, so watching for this as well. Obviously, we're nowhere near that now, you know, but, you know, over the, over the next couple of months, next couple of months uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye out for that. Exchange balances are also in current, uh, currently in heavy outflows. Um, and so we've talked about this before, you know, this is, uh, th this is kind of a structural shift that we've seen after uh, March of last year. You know, if you look at uh, this is the chart of basically all of Bitcoin's history, uh, you can see we're in this kind of distinct cluster of outflows, unlike anything that we've seen previously in Bitcoin's history, aside from some accumulation before the 2017 bull run. Um, and yeah, I mean, also, you know, with this in mind, what, what we're looking for on the bear side is, is to have a large uh, amount of inflows. So, for example, the spike here, uh, the day before the May 19th crash, I remember posting we had a, a a record amount of daily BTC inflows to exchanges uh, to Binance. So that was, you know, that was a big red flag. So if we start to see heavy, um, you know, uh, inflows to exchanges, as well as a bunch of supply becoming liquid, that's kind of a red flag that I'll be keeping an eye out for. 
And then lastly, we take a look at what's going on with miners. Uh, so a hash continues to come online. So over summer, we had the Chinese miner migration as all the Chinese uh, miners came on, uh, offline during the China mining ban. Um, and, you know, th this is, in my mind, a, a real bullish thing because you know, we, one, one of the big arguments against Bitcoin for a long time was that the mining, you know, the hash power was, was centralized in China. Uh, but, you know, although we had some kind of short term pain over the summer, now we're starting to see that hash come back online across the world in a decentralized way. So it just shows how resilient the Bitcoin network truly is. Um, and as well as as hash come back, comes back on the network, you know, the, the Bitcoin network is more secure. So, you know, I think that also can you, you can make an argument that the Bitcoin network is is more valuable as hash you know, you know grows. Uh, and then as well, we're looking at difficulty here in the purple blue line. Uh, which is just another reflection of how aggressive hash comes back online. We've had eight consecutive positive difficulty adjustments, which is pretty remarkable. With that being said, once again, uh, just shilling the shilling the uh, indicator dashboard that we have coming out soon as well. And then be sure to check out Blake's section on uh, Bitcoin related equities. He crushed it this week, uh, went really in depth this week. Uh, so I, I highly suggest that, that you check out his section. Um, and then as well, soon we, we have a new hire coming on to do a uh, Bitcoin mining related analysis for you guys. So that'll be another section in the newsletter that I'm looking forward to presenting for you. So with that in mind, uh, I hope you guys have a great weekend. And, uh, you know, if anything happens, you know, with, on a, on a you know, uh, time sensitive basis, then I'll, I'll probably post it on Twitter. But um, aside from that, guys, I hope you take it easy and, and enjoy this fall weather.